Well, good evening. I think we've reached a quorum, so we can uh, begin our discussion tonight. Thanks for coming along. This is our, uh, what is it, our uh, eighth session in uh, Evening at Egan this fall. I promised you way back in September that we would be moving through a series of pretty interesting uh, and some problematic um, areas. So we've been through clay, Afghanistan, oil spills, predator control, tonight seabirds. So we've had a pretty good menu for you this fall. Uh, I want to encourage you to um, come if you can next week for our penultimate evening of the um, of the series. Uh, next week will be Alexander Tutinoff and uh, his wonderful piano. Now, many of you that have been a part of these series for a while know um, what that experience is like, so I'd encourage you to come next week. Uh, I think we'll be holding that in this room uh, as well. And then finally, we'll return to the theme that started our discussions this fall with a um, discussion on November 20th about uh, predator control. I also wanted to give you a heads up for uh, the spring. We're going to try uh, to extend this opportunity for you and uh, university by holding some uh, additional evening at Egan's in the spring, which will uh, bring even more music to the community from UAS, as well as a couple of other opportunities. So uh, stay posted on that, and we'll make sure that uh, we do our job in getting that information out to you. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt Kirchhoff to you, who, uh, I, in watching him move around the room, uh, it quickly became evident that he knows far more people than I do here, so uh, that's a good, uh, good start to it. Um, Matt is the Audubon, Alaska's Director of Bird Conservation, and I commented to him he's had excellent training for spending the last 30 years here in Alaska by growing up in Rochester, New York, where, where he would have been overtrained for the environment that he's got here in Southeast Alaska. His education includes a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife and his Master's degree is in Zoology from the uh, University of Maine. Uh, most recently, his work has taken him to Glacier Bay and I think you're gonna hear a wonderful discussion about that work uh, tonight. Uh, he joined Audubon in 2008 and has been hard at work at uh, various conservation issues since then. So I hope you'll join me right now in welcoming Matt to us and look forward to it. Well, thank you for the introduction and it's of course very nice to be here. Um, I do know half the people in this room um, and it's great to be back. Uh, I really miss Southeast Alaska. For those of you that don't know, I've been 25 years in Southeast, and uh, we moved up to Anchorage a year ago, just about a year ago, to take this new job. So um, I'm happy to have a connection to Southeast Alaska through this research project in Glacier Bay. I hope to continue doing work in Glacier Bay. And um, what I'd like to do tonight is really do two things. I'd like to share with you some of the natural history of marble murelets and Kitlitz's murelets. These are two birds that are really quite remarkable in terms of their natural history and their behavior and their ecology. And they're birds that many of you see out on the water frequently and perhaps don't have as much of an appreciation for what their life is like. So I, I titled this through the eye, seeing Glacier Bay through the eyes of a marble mule because I, like I like to think myself of a bird and how it is viewing its environment and how it's responding to the different uh, the, the different parts of its environment. The second thing I'd like to do is basically give you a little more understanding of Glacier Bay and why Glacier Bay is so important as a population center for these two species. Uh, it is a hot spot for both Kitlitz's murelets and marble murelets. And we're just beginning to understand why that is. And I think there's some exciting new developments in terms of the research that's being done there. And I'm going to share some of that with you this evening. Assuming I can get this to work. This is why they tell me to come half an hour early to get. These are the two stars of the show. 
marble murelets on the left, Kitlitz's murelets on the right. All of you have seen marble murelets if you've been spent any time in southeast Alaska on the water or on the shore looking at the water. These birds are common out in Gastineau Channel it's all summer long. They're common in Glacier or in uh, Auk Bay. Um, if you're out trolling, you're constantly coming upon these birds. They're the ones that do a quick flip and dive, or if there's a little bit of wind, they might skip across the water like a stone skipping on the water until they can get airborne and fly away. Their wings are just a blur. Those are marble murelets, the most abundant seabird in southeast Alaska by far. Kitlitz is murelet, closely related, same genus, is a relatively rare bird, unless you've been to Glacier Bay or to Tracy Endicott Arm, you probably haven't seen a glacier murelet or the Kitlitz's murelet, sometimes called the glacier murelet. These birds are both about the size of a robin, although quite a bit heavier. Length is about the same as a robin, but they're fairly chunky, heavy seabirds. They share some similar ecological characteristics. The main thing that sets these birds apart from all other seabirds is their breeding behavior or their breeding ecology. Okay, they're both in the same species. Those, they both share a very unique ecology in terms of their breeding. When we think of seabirds breeding, we think of colonies. Seabirds, of course, are very vulnerable when they're on land. They need to avoid predators. And the way they do that typically, 97% of all seabirds in the world nest in colonies. So they find an offshore island with no mammalian predators, or they nest on a very steep cliff face, or they nest in crevices, or they nest in burrows, but some way to escape predators. And because there's millions of seabirds, and there's not lots of these sites, they crowd together in colonies in these highly um, protected sites. The Brachyrampus murlets, the marble murlet, the Kitlitz's murlet, have taken a completely different approach to nesting. Instead of nesting in colonies, they have decided to spread out. And they nest individually in nests far from shore, and they're very cryptic. Their goal to avoid predators is to basically disappear. We're going to talk first about marble murelets. These are two marble murelets. It's a pair of murelets. You can see they've got a cryptic brown coloration, very unusual for seabirds. Most are black and white. Most in the breeding season develop colorful plumes or colorful beaks. These birds go the other way during the breeding season. They pair, we believe, for life. They invest a great deal of effort in raising a single chick per year. Not always successfully, but they invest 30 days of incubation and 30 days of chick provisioning, bringing food to the chick. So the chick is basically being tended to for a two-month period, which is a big investment for these birds. And when the, both the adults, the male and the female, are sharing those responsibilities, they tend to be, they look the same. You can't tell a male marble murelet from a female marble murelet. They look exactly the same. They share the duties very equally between the male and the female. Kind of unusual, isn't it, in terms of rearing young. 24 hours on, incubating the egg, and then they switch, and the other, the other member of the pair spends 24 hours on the egg. And they do this on and off, on and off for 30 days, flying into the nest during the nighttime or in the early morning hours when it's dark so that predators can't detect where that nest is. So that's their, that's their grand strategy, and it's a very different strategy than so many of the other seabirds, 97% of the seabirds do it differently. It must work well because they're extremely abundant. Here's a nest tree, it's not a sham. And you can all see the nest, right? <laughs> Imagine you're a predator trying to find this murelet nest. And the murelet has done the nest exchange in the night, so you haven't seen where the bird came and went, it was dark. And now you're cruising over this forest and you gotta find, you're not gonna find that nest. It is there, I'll give you a hint. This is kind of like a little Where's Waldo exercise. Okay, does that help a little bit? Some of you can imagine a bird there, but a lot of you are probably saying, no, there's no bird there. We'll zoom in a little bit closer. How's that? Can everyone see this with the lights as they are? 
That is a bizarre place for a seabird to be nesting. It is in the upper canopy of an old growth tree on a natural moss limb, or a natural moss platform on a large limb, some overhanging vegetation to help shield it from aerial predators. But that just is a bizarre sight in a tree. And you can imagine if these birds are nesting in old growth forest trees up high, how hard it would be for people to find that nest. Before we had radio transmitters and could track these birds to their nest, how would we ever know where, it, where the bird nested? In fact, this species is the last species in North America to have had its nest actually discovered and described, 1974 in California. And a windstorm had blown through this park in California and damaged some trees, and they hired a tree climber to go up and limb these trees. And he's up there cutting these, these, these broken limbs out of this tree, and he steps out of this limb. And right, right there at his foot is a murrelet, a seabird, in a moss platform. And you know, he collects it, takes it down. That was the first nest that was actually described. I made a big point about the bird's nest in trees. That's always the case in the lower 48 states. As you move up towards southeast Alaska and Prince William Sound, an increasing percentage of the population nests on the ground. Those of you, I'm not sure everyone recognizes this view, right? You're looking across Gastineau Channel towards Douglas. That's the trailer park. This location right here is of a ground nest that was discovered last summer by Mary Wilson, who was doing a dipper study. She was walking up a stream looking for dipper nests, and she found a marble murrelet nest, or marble murrelet, murrelet chick, on the ground. Okay, Bob Armstrong was very interested in this, and Gus Van Vliet, and they started coming to the nest on a regular basis and taking pictures of the nest. And so I'm going to show you what this nest looks like. Pretty camouflaged. This bird is exposing itself to, to mammalian predators by being on the ground, but it's still pretty cryptic, still pretty hard to find. There's the chick. Pretty camouflaged. Isn't that amazing, the way that down blends in with the moss? There have been ground nests found before. Because people, because people are on the ground, a few, a few nests in conjunction with timber sails have been found on the ground. And we do know that they nest on the ground. The, the study that we did in Snedisham had about half of the nests actually on the ground. So as you move north, an increasing percentage of the nests are on the ground. But you know that's, that's really the, the aberration. It really is a tree nesting bird. Again, a single chick, a single egg, a single chick. And the parents, once the chick hatches, have to bring food to the chick. They don't bring it like some seabirds. You think of penguins bringing back a crop full of semi-digested fish meal and regurgitating it. These adults bring back an entire fish and they'll drop the fish off with the chick, and the chick will eat the fish whole. And we have a, another really cool picture that Bob took of an adult bringing a fish to the nest. Isn't that something? Look at the size of that fish. That goes down the gullet of that, of that chick. The, the baby, you can't see the chick very well because it's blurred and it's got its head down, but uh, this is a great picture of the adult delivering a fish to that chick. OK, let's see what's happening here. He's got a little ruff of downy feathers around his neck. He can't quite get to those. He's pulling the feathers off. He's getting ready. This chick is getting ready to fledge. It's just about the end of its 30-day growth period. It needs to be big enough and strong enough to make it from up on that hill all the way down to the water. Here's one of the other remarkable things about this species. This bird does this without any guidance from the adult. OK, some signal after about 30 days, 31 days, this bird says it's time to leave. And it just somehow knows how to fly, having never flown a lick in its life. It takes off. It knows which direction to go. It can fly for miles to get to the water without any prompting from the adult. It gets on the water. It knows how to catch fish without any teaching from the adult, all by instinct. And it keeps this down on it. It's just in the process. This, this bird is two days from fledging. Two days after this, the nest was empty. They didn't actually see the bird leave, but hopefully the bird was successfully, uh, successful getting down to the, to the ocean. OK, we'll switch gears now, and we'll talk about 
the other marble murelet, or the other, the other murelet. The marble murelet is a forest-loving species. The Kitlitz's murelet is a glacier-loving species. Okay, one likes trees and lush vegetation. The other, give it a flat rock, the top of a glacier, a mountain, and it's happy. Okay. Obviously, the different coloration is pretty clear. You know, the marble murelet is brown. This murelet is a lighter color. And I don't have any nests to show you of Kitlitz's murelets in these areas in, in Glacier Bay. But we do have some nests from the western end of the Aleutian Islands on Agatu. And just a quick story on how this nest was discovered. A graduate student from Kansas State University, Rob Kaler, was doing research on Everman's ptarmigan, rock ptarmigan, that was introduced to Agatu. And in the process of hiking along the Alpine, he flushed this bird. He wasn't sure what it was. But after a little investigation, it turns out it was a Kitlitz's murelet nest on a mountaintop on Agatu. The next year, he went back and did more systematic searches, sort of searching in a grid-like pattern, and found 12 nests. The next year, he went back and found 13 nests. In the course of three years, he found more nests for this species than have ever been found in the world in a place where you would not expect to see this bird. This is the glacier murelet, remember. There's no glaciers on Agatu Island. So it's very interesting. Another Where's Waldo exercise. We'll start easy. Okay, can everyone see where this cryptic nester is in this slide? Right there, okay. I've got a series of these. Rob was very generous in letting me use his slides. Nest number two, can everyone find the bird that's nesting in this picture? Right there. Nest number three, where is the bird? Where's Waldo in this picture? Right there. And the last nest, nest number four. I might say, this isn't fair. This is a foggy picture. You know, this isn't, the Aleutians are foggy. This is a good day on the Aleutians. It's usually raining. And, but you know, you imagine, imagine you're a glaucous wing gull, a predator looking for this, for this tasty morsel. And you're flying at 500 feet looking down. It would be pretty darn hard to see this bird. In fact, you probably can't see it yet, can you? How about that? How about that? OK. <laughs> remarkably cryptic. And so their whole strategy, instead of crowding into this raucous colony of all these noisy, conspicuous birds, they secrete themselves far away from the ocean in these kinds of settings. There's the chick, 17 days old. Looks a lot like the, kid, like the marble mule chick, except it's grayer, isn't it? It blends in really well with the surrounding rocks. In fact, from a distance, this would be, look just like a round rock. These chicks are not very vocal at all in the nest. They sit perfectly still. They're very docile. When they come to these birds, they, don't, they, they pick them up. They can weigh them. They can measure them. They put them down. And the birds have basically evolved. They know that movement and noise is their enemy. They want to keep as quiet and still as possible because that was, that's what protects them from avian predators. Another thing that ties these two groups of birds together is their foraging style. They're pursuit divers, which means they pursue prey, they pursue their food underwater. In this picture, the bird on top is a marble murelet. It's holding a sand lance. The bird on the bottom is a Kitlitz's murelet. It's holding a herring. These birds eat fish to a large extent in the summertime, but they also eat krill or zooplankton. Okay. We think in the spring and in the wintertime, a, a relatively larger percentage of their diet is krill. But in the summertime, when we see birds like this holding fish, what are they holding the fish for? They're waiting for the right time to fly that fish inland to feed to their chick. And so especially in the early evening hours, you'll sometimes see small groups of birds holding fish, just waiting for darkness to take that fish in to feed the chick. Some people equate the auk family or the elsid family, which is the family that the merlets belong to, with 
penguins in terms of their ecological equivalents. The penguins occur only in the southern hemisphere. The alcids occur only in the northern hemisphere. Both are pursuit divers. But the penguins have taken it sort of to the extreme. They've given up the ability to fly, and they have become extremely specialized at swimming underwater. Their wings have evolved into short flippers. The alcids, on the other hand, are trying to do a little bit of both. And they're probably not as efficient underwater as penguins, and they're probably not as efficient above the water as an albatross. You know, they've got this compromise that they've got to sort of struggle with. But again, it's a very common bird. It's very abundant, so it's obviously having some good success. The question is, do adaptations for underwater flight compromise their ability to fly through the air? This is a heavy-bodied bird. Look at the size of that bird's body. Pretty heavy and chunky compared to the wing size. So you'd think that bird is a bird that isn't going to want to fly very much. That's what I would sort of assume. They are extraordinarily fast flyers. I don't know whether that's because they're heavy and they have to fly really fast to stay airborne. But once they get up and go, once they skip off that water and they get up in the air, they are extraordinarily fast. A third of the birds, this, these, this data comes from using, from researchers in British Columbia who used radar to watch these birds streaking across the screen and measuring the speed with which they, they moved across the radar screen. 42 miles an hour is the most common cruising speed for these murelets, these in this case marble murelets. But they can also go 100 miles an hour between their nest and their foraging site. That's phenomenal. There's not another seabird that goes 100 miles an hour. <laughs> you think it was downhill. It might be downhill, actually. Uh, going from a nest to down, I don't know about that. But um, not only do they fly fast, but they fly far. This is the track of a bird that was captured and nested in the Mendenhall uh, Glacier area, marble mulet. And this is the approximate route that it took to Glacier Bay, where it was foraging. 65 miles, one way. It had to go both ways. It was probably carrying a fish for half of that. It may make this trip more than once. We don't really know. But it is an extraordinary accomplishment for a bird to fly two hours at that, at that speed. Lean and strong. Fat reserve sufficient for two and a half days. If you're a bird that has trouble flying, you want to reduce your weight load. You can't afford to be a penguin with a big fat body. You've got to have as little fat as possible, as much muscle as possible. They're one of the most heavily muscled alcids that exist. 26% of their body weight is pectoral muscle, flight muscle. Look at the muscles on the bird as they're taking off on this from the water. Extraordinarily strong. Very high metabolism. If you don't have much fat reserve, you've got to eat constantly to be able to do those kinds of flights, to be able to go inland to feed your chick. Those are very energy costly um, behaviors. What's the analogy? I'm looking at Kurt Gonzila here. Michael Jordan of the seabird world. <laughs> Mike, Kurt is a basketball buddy of mine, so that's why I mentioned that. Um, and I think if you think about these birds, Michael Jordan of the, of the seabird world, they are incredible athletes. They can accomplish, they can do, they, they are not lazy. They are phenomenally strong and phenomenally powerful. I'm going to talk about some of the differences between these species. We've already said, you know, they've got obviously different color, color plumage. We've talked, we've looked at the, at the uh, nesting habitat of the two species, and you can see how the bird that nests next to a tree trunk is going to be brown, the bird that nests on a gravel. Uh, mountaintop is going to be lighter colored. Some of these aren't quite as easy. Why are the bill sizes different? Normally, you would expect this might have something to do with feeding because they catch their food with their mouths. And in fact, looking at stable isotope analysis, looking at the feathers of these birds, the kidlets is merely with the smaller bill, eats a higher percentage of its diet, is krill and smaller prey. So this is, this is maybe one of the reasons this bird has evolved that particular morphology. But kidlets' murelets still have to be able to catch big fish. They have to be able to take a large fish to their chick, just as the marble murelet does. So the gape of the bill 
is really quite large. It looks like a little tiny bill, but when it opens its mouth, it's got a pretty big, pretty big mouth. So maybe there's something else here that's driving this small bill. And maybe there's something else isn't the fact that the bill is so small, but the feathers go down the bill a little further. Why would the feathers go down the bill further on the Kitlitz's murrelet than the marble murrelet? Well, here's one of the possibilities. The keel-billed toucan uses its bill to radiate heat. It's a tropical bird, and it loses heat. It helps regulate its body temperature by radiating heat out of its bill. If you think of the bill as a heat radiator, and you're a bird that lives in a very cold climate amidst icebergs in the water, you want to minimize the loss of heat through your bill. So maybe having more feathers that insulate your bill is a good adaptation. The range of the marbled murrelet closely parallels the range of the North American temperate rainforest, which is shown in green here. The number of birds in California, Oregon, and Washington is about 20,000. As you move up the coast, the numbers increase. About 75,000 in British Columbia. In, north, in south central Alaska, Prince William Sound, Kodiak, Cook Inlet, Kachemak Bay, 190,000. I've left the best for last, southeast Alaska, 678,000 birds. Why? 670, why? Why, many, why an order of magnitude more birds than any, any place else? It's, it's uh, puzzling. We'll try to figure out why that might be. One reason. This is a bird that goes between the water and between the forest. There is five times more shoreline in southeast Alaska. Think of the convoluted shoreline of southeast Alaska versus the linear shoreline of California, Oregon, and Washington. So if you're a bird that needs water to feed in and forest to nest in, southeast Alaska is ideal. More old growth in southeast Alaska than Oregon, California, and Washington combined. It wasn't always that way. I'm sure there was much more old growth historically in the lower 48 than they have here, but they've gone through it pretty quickly, and we have not gone through it as quickly up here. So that's another reason why we've got relatively good numbers. I'm going to do the same thing with Kitlitz's murrelets. Kitlitz's murrelets occur on both sides of the Bering Sea in low numbers. They occur on the Aleutian chain in low numbers. They occur on Kodiak, Kenai Fjords in relatively low numbers. So widespread patchy distribution, but these are relatively peripheral populations. The core of the population occurs where you've got mountains close to the ocean in association with ice. Prince William Sound, particularly the fjords in the northwestern portion of the sound, have very high densities of Kitlitz's murrelets. Icy Bay, Yakutat Bay, high populations of Kitlitz's murrelets. Glacier Bay, the biggest population, fully 25% of the global population of Kitlitz's murrelets occur in Glacier Bay. What's interesting about this, something really special about Glacier Bay, it happens to be the southernmost, nearly the southernmost extent of the Kitlitz's murrelet. There's some birds in Tracy Endicott Arm, small, small number, but this is really kind of the end of the line, and it's a really big population. So it's a really important area. This is a really cool graph. This was made by the Nature Conservancy. It shows water temperatures in southeast Alaska. Warm colors are warm. Cool colors are cold. The darker the blue, the colder the, color, the colder the water. And you can see from southern southeast Alaska through the northern part of southeast Alaska is a cold zone. And it's cold because you've got fjords that are dumping cold, fresh water, melting snow, glaciers into the, into the uh, upper marine waters. Look particularly at Glacier Bay and look at how dark and cold that water is pouring out of Glacier Bay. That's one of the keys, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Glacier Bay is 5,000 square miles to park and preserve, about the size of Connecticut. It is 27% covered by glaciers and ice. Okay, so it's a pretty cold, pretty cold place. You can tell from the plumes of sediment flowing down the bay and into Icy Strait that tremendous amount of fresh water from melting glaciers and streams is flowing into the bay carrying glacial flour or sediment, and it's streaming through the bay and out into Icy Strait. 
Glacier Bay is known for the amount of sediment in freshwater. So when you think about Gl Glacier Bay, it's really not a marine system. It's really one big estuary. It's the place where freshwater and saltwater mixes. The glaciers are melting. As they melt, water flows underneath the glacier. In this case, this is a grounded glacier. And you can see the water pouring out underneath the glacier. Um, as these glaciers continue to recede, they will continue to melt and pump out large quantities of fresh water laden with silt. This is a picture of what the water might look like. This is near the Marjorie Glacier in Glacier Bay. And you can see there's two different water masses, two distinct masses. One is fresh water, very cold, with lots of silt bumping up against a mass of relatively salty marine water. That front between those two water masses is a very important foraging area for birds and whales and seals and anything else that's looking for fish. Anytime there's a discontinuity, an edge, it tends to concentrate prey. So those features are really important for the birds. Of course, everyone knows that Glacier Bay is known for its glaciers and in particular its retreating glaciers. George Vancouver in 1794, if he had his 3D sonar on, would have detected this picture below his boat. Glacier Bay was not really a bay. It was just a small indentation in the coastline. Okay. The ice was all the way out to, to Icy Strait, miles wide, hundreds of feet high. And the interesting thing here, Notice that the glacier, the face of the glacier, is resting on a bed of till. This glacier, when it advanced, plowed a bed of till ahead of it. And as this glacier continues to advance and calve, it's depositing more silt, more sediment, more gravel. And it's building up this submarine moraine underneath the water. Now, as the, glacier cha as the climate changes and the glacier starts to recede, it will eventually fall off of this sill this big sill that's supporting the face of the glacier. Can you imagine what's going to happen at that point? Imagine this big, heavy glacier sort of just swinging in the water. It's not, it's, it's too big and heavy. It's not going to float. It's going to start unraveling. It's going to start calving at a very rapid rate, and it's going to start retreating. That's exactly what happened. By 1800, the glacier was here. It had gone from the mouth of, ice, from the mouth of Glacier Bay to about this point. By 1850, rapidly retreating to here. By 1900, big retreat, all the way to the head of Tar Inlet in the upper west arm. In this time, it was 1950, still additional retreats, but it's starting to slow down. You've, you've accomplished most of the uh, deglaciation. And by the year 2000, every 50 years, it's not changing much at this point. By year 2000, Glacier Bay is essentially deglaciated. There's only a couple of places, a couple of glaciers that are still tidewater and advancing. So most of, the, most of the marine waters of Glacier Bay are exposed. In the future, these glaciers will continue to recede and may thin, but you're not going to change the amount of water area much. I want to talk a little bit about why cold is good. Uh, this is the mouth of Glacier Bay. Lemisher Island is that big blob right in the middle of Icy Strait. Glacier Bay is dumping out. The, the, lighter colored, it, the lighter color in this slide is cold water. Okay, So up, near the, up, up, up north where the glaciers are, it's warmer than at the mouth of Glacier Bay. Right? I mean, that just seems puzzling to me. Why would it be colder at the mouth of Glacier Bay than it is up near the glaciers? Why is it colder there than in Eastern Icy Strait or in Cross Sound. What's causing this water to be cold right there? Well, if you think of Glacier Bay as a bathtub, you've got a layer of warm water in the top of your bathtub, and you've got the cold water, which is dense down in the bottom of the bathtub. And at one end of the bathtub, you've got the shallow rim. It's a little bit lower than the rest of the edge of the bathtub. And you've got a tide that changes 25 feet every six hour, up to 25 feet in a six hour period. And so this tide rushing in and rushing out is pulling deep water from the basin, from the bottom of your bathtub, up over that sill, which was under George Vancouver's boat at the mouth of Glacier Bay, pulling that cold water up over that sill. And it's flushing out into Icy Strait 
and then the tides are carrying it out towards Cross Sound. How did the birds react to this? We did many transects between Elfin Cove and Point Adolphus and points east. The size of these red circles represents the relative density of birds along this transect line. Look at how sharply the density drops off when you move from the cold water plume to the warm water area. For those of you that have not been to Point Adolphus, it is one of the most spectacular places to go. Put it on your list. The whale watching, the bird watching, the marine life there is absolutely phenomenal. In addition to doing those transects, we wanted to know if the birds were coming into this area from outside. We established a camp at Point Adolphus looking across Dicey Strait. We put one up in Sitakaday Narrows looking across Glacier Bay to see if the birds are going past that point. We put one out near Cross Sound to see if the birds are coming in. Thousands of birds an hour, thousands of birds an hour are flying through Icy Strait from east to west to get to this cold spot. Some days, thousands of birds an hour are not stopping at the cold spot. They're taking a right-hand turn and they're going up into Glacier Bay to feed in Glacier Bay. That, that slide I showed you, that bird traveling from Juneau to Glacier Bay, they know this is a good spot to feed. And they'll make that investment because they can come here and they know they're going to catch a fish. They're going to have really productive foraging. So we know this is an area that's important for birds. But what is it about the cold water? Certain prey species like cold water. Capelin, or referred to by some as the sea canary for marine ecosystem change. It's a cold water species. It moves around looking for cold water. It is a subpolar distribution. Glacier Bay is a refugium for capelin. It's probably the most abundant forage fish in Glacier Bay. Northern lampfish are a very unusual species that occurs in Glacier Bay. For those of you that are fisheries types, northern lampfish is a pelagic fish that generally occurs in the Bering Sea between 300 meters depth and 1,000 meters depth. It's a deep water fish. It's called a lampfish, but it's got sort of these photophores on its skin that emit, that sort of uh, emit light. It's upper upper portions of Muir Inlet and Tar Inlet. Really important forage fish because it's got, it's by far the highest lipid content, fat content of any other forage species. So if you're going to catch a fish, you want a fish that's going to give you a lot of energy. You don't want to catch no junk fish, you want to catch a really good, solid, fatty fish. Cold water slows, the down, slows down the fish, right? Fish are cold-blooded. A temperature change from 12 degrees to 7 degrees decreases the swimming speed of a fish, the maximum swimming speed of a fish by over 50%. So if you're, a, if you're a bird and you have to catch fish to take to your, you're going to look for cold water. You're going to dive deeper to get the colder water. You're going to have a much better chance of catching a fish if you're flapping your wings underwater trying to catch it if that fish is 50% slower. So we've established that cold is good. But Glacier Bay is not getting any colder. This series of photos shows Upper Muir Inlet in 1941, 1950, and 2004, a period of 60 years, not much time. And look at how that environment has changed. If you're a merlet in this area in 1941, it's not very good. There's no water to feed in. You've got some nesting habitat there in the lower left-hand corner of the 1941 slide. 1950 might be good for a Kitlitz's murelet. You've got water to feed in. You've got icebergs. You've got some bare rock to nest on. But by 2004, there's not much bare rock in this picture. Plenty of water. And now maybe it's becoming more valuable for marble murelets. Okay. One of the things that was a real eye-opener for me last year when I was working in Glacier Bay was walking to the head of Wachusett's Inlet and finding stumps coming out of the gravel, and big logs laying on the outwash plain. And normally I see that, I think, well, these came from a tree that fell in the stream up, fell in the river upstream someplace and floated down. Except you realize you're standing at the head of a valley, and up ahead of you is a glacier. There's no trees. There's no forest. What that was was the glacier moving at some point in the past, overrunning a forest, killing the trees, 
burying the trees, and when the glacier retreated, the trees are left for us to find. And they radiocarbon date these trees so you know when the tree was growing. And thousands of years ago, there was a forest at the heads of some of these inlets that today look like the moon. I mean, they're just recently deglaciated, but at some point in the past, 6,000, 8,000 years ago, which isn't very long, there were forests here. And by looking at the radiocarbon dates of these trees, they have determined that in Glacier Bay over the last 9,000 years, the forests, the glaciers have completely filled and completely emptied the bay two or three times. So the take home message is that Glacier Bay is not one dimensional or static, it's always changing. And we're talking about 10,000 years, we're not, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of years, we're not talking about the Pleistocene, this is in the Holocene, this is the last, this is during the period of human occupation. It's pretty remarkable. So I'll conclude by returning to my promise to give you a look at Glacier Bay through the eyes of a merlet. So pretend you're a merlet and you're sitting in the water in Wachusett's Inlet. This is about the middle of Wachusett's Inlet in Upper Glacier Bay. And you're looking towards the Carroll Glacier receding in the background. Life is pretty good. You've got lots of food. You've got lots of area to forage in. The glacier that retreated and re advanced and retreated and advanced has left submarine sills that are responsible for upwelling as the tide changes, so it's a pretty good feeding environment. And in the distance, you can see some glacial till and some moraines that are providing potential habitat for your nesting. If you're a murelet sitting here, you're probably a Kitlitz's murelet. Most of the murelets today in, in this particular location are Kitlitz's murelets. They outnumber marbled murelets in Massachusetts Inlet. 50 years ago, not even 50 years ago, 30 years ago, if you were sitting right here in a boat or in a kayak, you would see a wall of ice in front of you that might be 200 feet thick, stretching from shore to shore. There'd be icebergs in the water and active calving occurring because the glacier would be retreating. This would be good habitat for you if you were a Kitlitz's murelet, probably not very good if you're a marbled murelet. One of the members of my field crew talked about being in Wachusett's Inlet in a kayak in 1977 and unable to get very far at all because it was just choked with ice. And he comes back 40 years later and the ice is completely gone. 300 years ago, this area was not even available to murelets. It was under several thousand feet of ice. And 8,000 years ago, it looked very much like this, except that instead of alders along the shore, it had a mature forest. So when you think about climate change and what that means to these birds, I sometimes think if I could wave a magic wand and stop climate change or fix the climate or the environment at some point in time, what is normal? What is the right point in time that we should be aiming for? It's pretty hard to answer that question because naturally this environment is constantly changing. And these birds that have existed for 1.6 million years as separate species have been able to change with that environment. They probably haven't always been in Glacier Bay, but they've been able to go someplace and recolonize Glacier Bay. This isn't to minimize the concern about global warming or climate change because I think what we're looking at in the future is beyond what we've seen in the past, in the past millions of years, in terms of the rapidity of change and the extent of change. And I think the question of whether Kitlitz's murelets and marble murelets can adapt to that new change, that abnormal rate of change, is still very much an open question. So I hope you've gained an appreciation for the natural history of these remarkable birds and the importance of Glacier Bay as, a, as, a, as an environment that changes but is very important, not so much because of the ice that's there now, but because of the legacies of the ice that has been there for eons in the past. I'll close by thanking the people that helped support our research efforts in Glacier Bay including the funders, 
many volunteers, a number of which are in the audience today, um, contributed a tremendous amount of work, uh, valuable work to this effort. I um, want to thank them. Um, private funders helped match the state fish and game, fish and game grant, and I want to acknowledge many of the murelet researchers that are working on these two species across the state for their ideas and the discussion and the, uh, the just sort of rich collaboration that uh, is occurring across the state with regard to these two species. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and your time. And if you've got some questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. That was really fascinating. I wonder, uh, we must certainly, after all of that, have some questions from the floor. Or anyone have any issues that they'd like to take up? Yes. Let me get back to each of the questions with the microphone since we're recording and broadcasting simultaneously on this. Um, about that bird in Douglas that was on the ground, how long would the parents stay with it to feed it? The parents would be, would be bringing food to that bird for about a month. No, how long would they stay? Oh, um, they stay for probably five to ten minutes, just briefly. Um, they'll, you know, it varies a little bit. We've, we've had some cameras on some nests, so we know a little bit about this, but it's, it's not long. They just uh, wait there five or ten minutes. Any other yes. Matt, could you expand a bit about this, how, a, given the aerodynamic abilities of the bird, I mean, specific nest locations and how these birds arrive in the nest and leave from the nest? Yeah, okay. isn't that interesting? Think of a bird that's flying 40 miles an hour and has to hit a nest <laughs> in a tree. And how's it going to do that? Um, I haven't seen it myself, but I've heard it described this way. If you're a jet airplane and you've got a stop and land on a nest. You're going to fly in low, and you're going to fly up, and you're going to stall at the nest. Okay, So you can imagine flying in really fast because you've got to maintain speed to keep your flight speed, but then you swoop up and you hop on the nest as you stall out. It's one of the reasons they think old growth forests are particularly important for these birds, or why these birds might nest near streams or openings, because they need that opening for the approach to the nest, and they need the opening or the drop to get off the nest. And so that bird that's on the ground nest probably drops off the ground towards that stream that's in that little ravine, and it flies that, that stream ravine out. But that's presumably how they manage that landing problem, because it, it, would, be, it would be difficult. Have you seen whether or not they fly underwater with their wings like a penguin does? Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry that wasn't clear. They do flap their wings underwater. And they've got video, cam video footage of birds in aquariums, for example, doing this. Um, all of the elsids, the puffins, the murres, the murlets, the auklets, all fly with their wings underwater. How long do they live and do they breed all their lives? Because these are non-colonial nesters, it's very difficult to know what their lifespan is. If you're a mer and you're nesting on a colony, they come back to the same ledge every year. And you can put a band on the bird and you can recapture it. And you can say, this bird came back 20, 25, 30 years. Because these are non-colonial nesters, we don't have the ability to do that. We don't even know if they necessarily nest in the same we, Pretty sure they don't nest in exactly the same nest every year. Um, so the life expectancy of these birds is on the order of 15, probably to 20 years. And I say that because larger bodied elsids, where we do have their lifespan known, tend to be, that tend to be longer lived. And as you get the smaller and smaller colony nesting birds, they become shorter lived. So if you sort of plug the weight of the marble murelet in on that regression line, you would expect 15 to 20 years. In terms of their breeding attempts, they have deferred breeding, so they don't breed until they're probably three years old. And then they breed every year until they die. Not very successfully. You can imagine, you know, these are, these are birds that have to replace themselves in a population, for a stable population, they have to replace themselves 
in that population. So over their lifespan, two birds have to produce two chicks. And so there's going to be a lot of failures in between. Follow-up question to that. Um, given how counterintuitive that reproductive strategy is for a bird, particularly, have you ever sat down with a little glass of scotch and wondered about the evolutionary imperatives that would drive that kind of strategy? Um, not so much with scotch, but it, you know, Corona. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's interesting to think about whether seabirds were originally tree nesters or whether they were originally colony nesters, and whether this is a relic of the tree nesting that used to occur. When you think about this, this Alcid family, they evolved, they originated 25 million years ago at the height of the Miocene, when Don Redwoods extended all the way up, the hardwood forests were all the way up into the Brooks Range, or what will become the Brooks Range. It was a forested Alaska, and birds at that time were probably tree nesters. And you know, at what point some became colony nesters, or whether I'm even correct in my assumption that maybe they were originally, originally all tree nesters. You know, I don't know when that occurred. But in terms of this strategy, the very fact that the bird is so abundant in southeast Alaska, and the advantage that this strategy has over the colony nesting strategy is if you're a colony nesting bird nesting with hundreds of thousands, or in some cases millions of birds in the same colony, you're tied to that colony because your chick is there and you can only forage as far as you can fly and get back to the colony. So you're competing with all of these birds in a fixed area tied to that colony. When you lose the colony, you lose that restriction, and you can forage everywhere along the entire 15,000-mile shoreline of southeast Alaska. It opens up huge amounts of foraging habitat and huge amounts of potential nesting habitat. So I think that is the evolutionary advantage that that strategy conveys on those birds. Yeah, Matt, would you say something, please, about what's known about population trends in both these species over the course of years? Population trends in both species are down across most of their range. Uh, most of the areas where we've done surveys show declining population trends. Um, interestingly, we did surveys last year in Glacier Bay. We repeated a survey that had last been done in 1993, and the density of marble murelets was about the same in 2009 as it was in 1993, and the Kitlitz's murelet population was roughly twice in 2009 what it was in 1993. I'm not prepared to say that means the populations are increasing. I think it raises more questions than it answers. But to me, it means that maybe the population that we're surveying in any of these small areas is really a piece of a population that can move in and move out. In some years, there's more birds there. In other years, they're offshore or they're doing something else. And so I think what that, what that shows is that we probably need, we need longer-term monitoring to really know what the trends are. And um, we need a very consistent, uniform monitoring protocol in these areas. Pardon me? Probably multiple sites as well. And multiple sites as well, absolutely. But the evidence is pretty fair that south of here, at least, the marbled has declined significantly, oh, correct? Oh, absolutely. The marbled murelets are listed as a threatened species in the lower 48, primarily out of concern for habitat loss. The loss of lo the, lo the logging of old growth forests is so greatly diminished their, their nesting potential or their availability of nest sites. And what little fragments are left are very vulnerable to depredation by jays and ravens and things that sort of you know, you've got all this edge, and it just, it's very difficult for the birds to make it down there. I have a, two questions. First of all, you said when the chick leaves, it had no training, and it flew off. Does that mean it's by itself then, without parents? Correct. And is that unusual among birds or other animals, that it's apparently all instinct? You know, I'm not, I, I can't speak to all birds. Um, in terms of the alcids, it is a little unusual. You know, the, 
common MERS, for example, fledge very quickly and they're with their parents, or they're, they're the adults uh, on the water for some period of time. Marble murrelets, um, yeah, they basically put all their investment into the birds while they're on land instead of on sea. These birds have to develop sufficient muscle mass to make it to the ocean. And so they, the, uh, the, you know, the thing that's remarkable to me is that they know how to, when they get there, they know what to do. You know, they know how to catch a fish or, a, uh, you know, it's just how to fly underwater. Um, it's without any, any instruction. That's what my other question was. Could you just describe what happens, how the bird sees a fish? I see, I guess, is what they do. And then how they capture it and how long they can stay under the water? Good questions. Um, any of you that have opened your eyes in the swimming pool know that you can't see very well underwater, right? And you think, how can a bird that has to be able to see in air be able to see underwater? Well, it's got special adaptation that can change the shape of its eyeball so that it adjusts for that different density between the air and the water. So its vision underwater is really quite good. It has to find fish that are slow and generally fish that are in a ball. And they take advantage of these, these feeding situations. You think about the prey in the ocean, it's not dispersed, it's clumped. And the challenge for a seabird is to find those clumps. And oftentimes you'll find places where Birds are diving on the fish from above. Kittiwakes or gulls are diving on the birds from above. And other predators are coming up from below to catch those fish. And these fish are in these tight balls or schools. And when you've got a situation like that, it's fairly easy for kitlitzes or marble murrelets to, to swim into those balls of fish and get a fish. You think about them chasing an individual fish, it's much harder. But these, that's why they prefer these upwellings and these fronts, because it concentrates the prey and it makes it easier for them to catch a fish. But they're basically chasing it down. I mean, they're basically swimming after a fish and in some cases stabbing it with their bill and in some cases pinching it and grabbing it with their bill. And how long under the water? Um, I've watched birds forage um, do 100 or more consecutive dives with an average dive time of 40 seconds and an average pause time between dives of nine seconds. So if you, it's, like, it's like swimming under the water the length of the Juno Douglas High School, coming up for five seconds, swimming underwater. You know, it's just, it's pretty phenomenal. Their recovery is, is really pretty amazing in terms of their ability to dive. Matt, you talked about uh, predation on land. Uh, what's a typical predator under the water for, for these birds? A predator on these birds underwater? Yeah. Who's, who's after them under the water? I don't know that too many things are after them under the water. We do find, interestingly enough, when whales defecate, they sometimes defecate murrelets. <laughs> and I've got some pictures to prove it. It looks like a featherless chicken floating in the water that has been caught by a whale, maybe bubble net feeding, but coming up under this ball of bait fish while you've got these unsuspecting murrelets in there feeding and the whale just whoosh, Takes the, takes the murrelets and, and digests them partially. I mean, they're feathered and waterproof, so they kind of pass through. But that's one thing that happens. That's bycatch. That's bycatch. <laughs> I don't think the whales are actually targeting the birds. I've actually seen river otters take a marble murrelet. I think that's pretty rare. But a river otter came up and, and grabbed, a, grabbed a bird. I don't think they get much predation pressure from down below. They're looking out for peregrine falcons. They're looking out for bald eagles. They're looking out for things that are going to swoop down and catch them, especially as they take off from the water and they're just getting up to speed. They're quite vulnerable. In fact, one of the concerns in Glacier Bay is that the, the cruise ships, which go, on, go, go towards those ice along those, those glaciers, are flushing kitlitzes and murrelets. And maybe the peregrine falcons are getting wise to this. Some peregrine falcons that have been seen actually roosting on the bow or the flagpole of the cruise ship. And they just, oh, there's some killers. I'm going to wait till they flush. And as soon as they take off the water and they're just getting going, I'm going to dive down and I'm going to get them. We found two killers as murrelets last year in Glacier Bay, floating on the water in the wake of a cruise ship. And we thought, I wonder if the cruise ship hit those birds. We picked them up, gave them to Michelle Kissling at the Fish and Wildlife Service. She did a necropsy on them with a veterinarian. It turns out both of them were killed by avian predators. 
One had been grabbed on the wing and it sliced the artery in the wing and the bird bled to death. But the bird had obviously had to drop it. Another one had a puncture wound from a talon in the back of its head and it was dropped. But finding two birds, both of which were killed by avian predators, is pretty unusual. I don't want to keep people unnecessarily long. If there's a couple of questions, we can do that. I'm happy to stay longer and answer questions, but I don't want to keep people longer than me. Yeah, my question was about the breeding season. So I, if I saw 100 uh, murrelets in summer straight, say in June, would they be, would they include any young or is the breeding season later in the summer? These are asynchronous breeders, which means that they don't all start breeding at the same time. They sort of start breeding you know, in a staggered fashion. If you're looking at birds in June, you're not looking at juveniles. There may be at the end of, the June, at end of June just a few juveniles starting to show up, but the birds you see in June are almost all adults. By the time you get into July and certainly into August, you'll start seeing some of the juveniles. To give you an idea of the asynchronous nesting, we were capturing birds in, in Port Snedisham several years ago. I took a picture of the two assistants, Julie Kohler was one of them, holding the two birds. One of the birds is laying an egg, <laughs> squeezing it too tightly perhaps. And the bird is laying an egg. That same night, we caught a bird that was a fledgling that had already gone through the entire incubation period and the entire chick provisioning period, two months. So there's a two month difference, one bird laying an egg, one bird already at sea. So. Well, let's join together and thank Matt for a really interesting evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.